what can we do? What should we do? Um, other than write your congressman, I'm not sure that does any good, frankly. But uh, what should we do as a community? I, we're, you know, we're talking about art and cultural districts. We're talking about uh, spaces. We're trying to create a downtown art. We're trying to change the school system. You know, K through 12 as well as the university. That's another problem. Another. What should we be doing? You know what? Great question. Um, all of these benefits that we heard about, plus more, to come with this vibrant cultural community. And we didn't even get into arts education, how young people are performing better academically uh, when the arts are part of their education, better test scores, better grades, lower dropout rates, findings that cut across all socioeconomic strata. We didn't even talk about how people are healing faster and uh, when the arts are part of their health care and as we're aging. You know, that's a whole different speech. But a vibrant arts, you know, we're building a healthier San Diego County through the arts. And so what do we do? Well, one of the things we need to do is we need to invest in the arts and in our artists. And that's the city, that's the county, that's our businesses. You know, there's no free lunch out there, folks. If we want this vibrant arts and culture community, we need to invest in it. But you know what? That appropriations go around, comes once a year. What do you do the other 364 days? we got to work to create a more artful San Diego County. Every government's got their advisory boards, their commissions, you know, there's one for roads, there's one for signs, there's one for airports. What's you know, the citizen engagement? Is there artists or arts and representation on all of those? Because when the arts are part of this decision making, it makes good decisions better decisions. Uh, it's putting arts in the streets, putting arts on the walls, it's making the arts part of every single uh, decision that we make. And that's what's also creating that you know creative, culturally vibrant community. So um, we need to make sure we're encouraging that to happen. You know, who here's uh, you know the nonprofit arts and cultural organization? A lot of hands, you all have boards of directors. I know you do because you gotta. Um, you need to tell this story to them and actively others as well. You know, advocacy, right? Have to advocate. I break it down to three questions. What's the message? Who gets the message? Who delivers the message? Well, we talked about a whole bunch of messages today. You know, um, arts, you know, there's businesses driving tourism, you know, uh, and uh, creative economy, you know, downtown redevelopment, innovation, creativity, um, on down the line. So there's lots of messages. Who gets the message? Those are the decision makers, the authorizers in our environment, maybe electeds, it might be city council people. And then who delivers the message? There's us, of course, right? You know, we're the army, we gotta do it, but who else can be mobilized? We make sure, I'll give you an example, we make sure there's an arts presence at both political conventions every four years before the presidential uh, election. So we were with the RNC and uh, you know, Mike Huckabee was chairing a panel of Republicans and we had you know, a great room full of people in there to talk about the arts. Well, one of the speakers was the mayor of Mesa, Arizona, told a story about budget hearing night and um, said, you know, it was budget hearing night for the arts and all the arts people, there's about 60 of them lined up and they did their three minutes and everything. And he said, you know, I noticed the chief of police was there, which wasn't that unusual, you know, it was a city council meeting, but he was in full chief of police regalia, hat, tie, medals, which was a little different. And after everybody else had testified, he asked for three minutes. And he said, um, basically, you know, if you have to take a cut out of their budget in arts, I bet you just took it out of my public safety budget, because when they do their job well, it makes my job easier. Man, can you imagine if we had a thousand police chiefs on that message? So who delivers the message is really important. And we talked, we've got some great research here that will bring in, um, you know, those, those champions for the arts. Long answer, but uh, a couple of thoughts there. I, I have a short answer. Uh, if we want a vibrant arts community, region, um, number one is buy art. Yeah! Yeah! yeah. Woo! Yeah. I mean, you know, such a young power to stay here if they're not some work that goes someplace where they can, right? So that's pretty simple. The second is elect leaders who understand this argument because they're the ones that are making policy decisions about where money gets spent. So I applaud the work Randy's doing because everybody who's running for public office should be asked about what contribution are they making to enriching the arts community in that, in that area. And if that answer
answer is not satisfactory, maybe they shouldn't get your vote. Um, I'll just add, uh, we follow a company called Resonance. They measure cities' um, place equity around the world, and really it's the quality and the value of the, the space and the place. Um, and art is a very important piece of that, um, and public art as well. And I think having those public art programs, like, you know, I don't know, seeing the horses in Del Mar right now, and the Port of San Diego has public art, but every city should really have public art programs. And I'll just add with the youth, we were just in LA doing uh, focus groups because we've lost uh, visitation at LA for a number of reasons. Um, you know, is it Instagrammable? I mean, we heard that. What's Instagrammable? And public art is such a great way to show the place and the feeling. And, the, you know, everyone wants to stand up to something and get that Instagram photo out there. So, part of the futuristic thought on that. But, I've got my own microphone. Um, just, just a comment from me, really, that coming from outside of this education system in the U US, I come from the UK, it was quite a surprise to me that art and music uh, education it was, is treated almost like a luxury item here. And when my son was in the Carlsbad High Choir, the parents are continually scratching around for funding to, to have them go and compete and tour, which I thought was crazy in such a wealthy society. Why is education funding sort of marginalized in that way. I don't, I don't understand it, I still don't. Um, at Legoland we actually support education in certain ways and we, every year we have the Celebrate Carlsbad Day uh, through which we, we push back real money into the Carlsbad education system which we're very happy to do, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but it still strikes me as odd that that's not kind of taken care of. So I think there's a huge piece here about education at the young age, you know, that, that really activate young artistic minds. I have a question for Susan. If I have a huge non-profit arts organization in North County, how do I get onto your radar? organization as well. Um, so joining as a member, and we have groups of members as well, which is Brewers Guild, Arts Commission, so groups. So, you know, the more you can come together and also work with our membership team, we have open house hours um, where you can come and meet the teams. But, I mean, a big thing is, you know, we've got four people in our public relations group that they're, again, busy hosting, they're traveling around the world, they're getting press releases out all the time, so we need to hear from you. You can email what's going on with your business, what are the events, what are the things you have to offer, and getting that into our team. Um, you um, can post your events, we have a member on the back of our website that allows you to put your profile of your business, your events, your arts organization on there, so we're bringing the people to San Diego, we want them to think San Diego instead of Right? Orlando, LA, Vegas, any other when they're looking. Once they get here, then you need to kind of show your, fight for your, your traveler, right? In your business. Um, we also have travel trade teams that when international folks are coming in from China, that market is growing so much. UK, all of our large markets. We have Lufthansa direct flight starting next, um, uh, <coughs> next year. Um, which is exciting. So, again, it's getting your information into our team so we can include it in our press releases in our international um, market familiarization teams. And I know we're working with a lot of uh, people here in the room, but that will be the best. Hi, I have a similar question. Um, I am on the board of directors and one of the founding members for the Art Center of Ramona. And when we talk about North County, the inland tends to be forgotten. <laughs> but uh, we're being noticed more, mostly because of the wineries. We're no longer just a stop on the way to Julian. People are coming up for the wineries. Um, we started because there was no location for artists to teach classes and no direct way for the artists to come in contact with the actual people. <laughs> 
So um, we're a very small organization. We've started really small, and we're ready to move out and get larger. Uh, we just joined the North County Arts Network. You just, Susan, just gave us an idea of how to get more onto San Diego's radar. We need more money for our budget. Right now, there's not a single paid position. Um, except for the teachers themselves, which is something that is very important for us. That all the money that comes in from the classes, there's a small rental fee and the rest of it goes directly to the teachers. Because as you were saying, by art, part of what happens is everybody in San Diego loves to say that they love the arts and then it's always followed by, will you do this for free? Um, <laughs> which I've noticed nobody says to their plumber. <laughs> so um, we're just starting to wonder, we are just got big enough that we can start reaching out. What would be our next step to start getting some more money to budget more things? We're doing free salons, we're doing classes, we're doing art exhibitions, we have an abandoned art project, we've reached out to the local schools, but as far as, and we're about ready to start memberships for the first time, so we are getting a little bigger every time, but then what's next? Ramona is not incorporated, so the funding is not the same as the funding for the city. So do you guys have any ideas of where would we move next? Because we have huge visions, huge plans, but we're at a place where we need forward motion. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, the here's the thing. Um, one of the things I published uh, last year is one of the largest public opinion surveys in the arts ever conducted. You know, over 3,000 interviews, and what we see is a growing share of the population um, engaging personally in the arts. Actually, now 49 percent of the uh, American adult population personally engaged, whether you know it's be taking a dance class, it's attending one of your art classes. Um, so, number one, I think that is, uh, that is a minute, an amenity that people are starting to look for. Uh, I would, you know, I mean, it's like a lot of little things, there's no silver bullet, but, uh, you know, is there a chamber of commerce or somebody, or, um, you know, the organization that's responsible for attracting businesses and workers uh, to come and live in, and be based in the region, and make sure they're getting their name uh, out there as well, because what we have heard is that the workers in this new economy were looking for these creative workers, right? Well, so I have to tell you, I've been to several cities lately where I hear, you know what our number one export is? Highly educated young people. Ouch, right? I mean, just the wrong thing. And they've asked them, what are you looking for? And they, you know, what would keep you here? I said, look, you want me to be creative and innovative in the workplace? I'm a creative person. I want to attend art. I want festivals. I want to art maker spaces. I want to be personally involved. Uh, you know, and then have it downtown and that type of thing. So uh, make sure that, um, you know, those business attraction, the economic development folks are pitching you as well, because that's going to be the earned income piece. Um, partner with the businesses is also, you know, maybe how can we bring some creativity uh, into the different workplaces, uh, the create the workers you've got, and then uh, you know again, you know, connecting with the schools. Um, so things, you know, some of these things may have done, uh, but I think that really builds the solid foundation of, uh, hey, Ramona, this is a place to live, to create, to make art. Um, and, and, you know, and to have this great cultural vibrant community can be the core of that, so, I mean, that's, that's it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kathy LePage, and thanks, Helen, for bringing that to the forefront. I'm the volunteer event coordinator for the Ramona Art and Wine Festival, which is um, on November 4th this year. It, we're in the fifth um, year for that. Um, and the proceeds to that uh, event go to the Ramona Hart Mural Project, which we have several murals that we've put up, and it, it, it funds the uh, maintenance and whatnot. Um, tapping into what Helen was saying, um, it'd be cool to find out resources for grants or sponsorships on local and state and national levels that we could tap into for resources for the art community in Ramona and also um, creating 
partnerships? What fundraising opportunities um, can you teach us that will benefit the arts community in Ramona? And also, um, let's see, um, docent and uh, volunteer training. Uh, you know, it, okay. <laughs> and um, let's see, and then just providing us with resources that we can tap into. We do have a Chamber of Commerce. We're really small. We have um, been granted money through the county supervisors, um, and, but it's you know a small amount. Um, and like Helen was saying, we're unincorporated, so that's always a challenge. Um, but um, it'd be great to have the resources available to us and partner with um, your programs that you have available. And I also wanted to ask David, um, are you working with the city um, to implement an art requirement for developers? Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, I'd support it if the city took the initiative, um, but frankly, I get a competitive advantage if I have art in my project and other people don't, so it's really going to be up to them to get smart about this. Uh, you make a really good uh, argument about the economic benefits of arts and culture uh, to the overall economy. And uh, my question is, uh, arts pretty much survive on people giving them money. You know, that's why it's, it's like a handout. But you've made the point that arts provide an economic return, and I'm just wondering if there's been any analysis nationally or locally about um, the investment potential of arts uh, to provide a return in order to do more art. You know, it's a pro like a private equity approach to funding arts. Uh, you've made, you've provided data to say that it has economic return. Has that ever been monetized in the form of investment funds? Do you know anything like that going on nationally or locally? Um, well, uh, so here's one of the interesting things. Um, about the studies themselves. Uh, you know, it's a 30, every study region has a 30 page report. If you look on page 15 and 16 of each uh, community's report, there's an arts and economic prosperity calculator, which is a way to estimate the economic impact of your organization or group of organizations or updated. Um, and it's simply used, you can do it on the back of a napkin. And actually, even on our website as well, americansforthearts.org slash economic impact, you can find more general um, uh, this arts and economic prosperity calculator where you enter in an expenditure figure, an attendance figure, and you can estimate what the economic impact and calculate that is uh, for your organization or group of organizations. So to turn that around, then you can say, well, if the city, you know, is, makes a million dollar investment, we're going to get all these wonderful benefits, but, you know, here's what you can estimate that economic impact uh, would be. Um, so, you know, that would be one way to use that tool. And another way, um, every, you know, everybody can be using these tools uh, to uh, talk about their economic impact. Remember the, um, the study with the maps, uh, the map and all the little dots on it, Creative Industries? Give you another website, americansforthearts.org slash creative industries. I've got all 3,123 counties in the country, all every congressional district, every state, every state legislative and assembly district um, has its own two page report. So you can actually pull down something that's very localized and say, here's what the you know, creative industries number uh, are for our um, assembly district or our county, that type of thing, and use that, uh, again, as, as a very localized advocacy tool. Uh, so um, one can sort of help you project to your question specifically. Both uh, would be very effective tools in helping you talk about your organization's role in, in building a healthier local economy. I have a 
I have a specific answer for you. Um, so the city of Denver created a SCTD, they created a TAC. Yeah, SCF, right. So, so it's a, I think it's a sales tax. And it's been in place for 25, 30 years, it's been for a while, anyway. And the money has to go towards investment in arts organizations. And Denver has, over the last 25, 30 years, really created an incredibly vibrant art scene, partly because of this tax. I think they raise about 35, 40 million dollars a year. But they have to audit and measure the impact of that tax because it comes up, I think, every five years. So there's a series of reports that are prepared by Arthur Anderson or one of the big firms that looks exactly at the question, what's the return on investment that the city's getting for putting money into arts organizations? It's pretty stunning. And so it started off getting like 52% approval vote, right, because it has to come up every five years or seven years. Now it's like 70%. And partly it's because the economic case for that tax has been so persuasive that even people who didn't think it was such a good idea at first say, well, gee, it's driving jobs, it's driving tourism, plus I'm getting all this great, you know, artistic enrichment. So I think that's one example of how that can be measured. All right. Um, so obviously you can't have a, a creative um, and flourishing arts community without artists. And as an educator, when I look at the young people that are my charges and they talk about going into a career in the arts, I don't personally feel that I can good in conscience tell them that yes, you have an economically viable future in the arts. Convince me I'm wrong. Well, I go, uh, <laughs> number one, um, there's growing demand. So one of the other things I do is the National Arts Index, uh, which is you know the national uh, measures of the health and vitality of arts in the United States. And I can tell you in the last 16 years, the number of college arts degrees uh, conferred every year has grown from 75,000 a year to 139,000 a year. So people want to be artists, and we see a growing uh, share of college-bound seniors who take the SAT saying, that's my intention. Um, so we see more double majors, we see a big bump in design degrees. Now, the other way to look at that is, oh my god, that's just more artists, you know, in the, on the horizon and more competition, right? Um, go back to uh, the conference board research. Go back to what America's business leaders um, say uh, among the top five applied skills I'm looking for is creativity. What are the biggest city indicators of creativity? And there were two, way at the top, ahead of everything else. Starting your own business, okay, we like that entrepreneurial activity. And two, study of the arts. Um, that's got uh, value, that's got gravitas uh, in the business world. Um, so, I mean, that to me is showing there's demand uh, from the business world. Uh, the IBM, IBM every uh, one or two years does this global leadership survey. And in 2010, um, biggest indicators of uh, leadership, creativity. Uh, this was, you know, international studies, 60 countries, 1,500 business leaders. Um, arts, creativity, it's got a whole different uh, value now, and it's got um, a lot of value. It's an asset. Uh, that folks are looking for. And it gets back to what John talked about. Um, you know, in 20 years, 47% uh, of the uh, jobs we have now you know, are going to be gone. We need what the arts teach. Creativity, ability to ask a question, ability to deal with ambiguity, um, you know, the ability to say, what if, what if, what if. Um, I credit my arts education. Uh, I fall back on my arts education all the time. Um, and it's, it's made me a better problem solver, a better problem identifier. Uh, so, um, you know, it's got a lot more value uh, now than it does. I wouldn't hesitate to send my kids down that road. Hi, good morning. So also working in schools, a lot of what we do, like all of you within the arts, is to inspire. And you're right, we can't, we don't know what jobs are going to come. Um, we constantly talk with our students about what was 10 years ago and what is today. And so looking back at this number provided earlier, the 35,000, is it 914, 941? 914 jobs. Um, what are those categories of jobs? Are they including 
graphic designers, fashion designers, etc. Uh, so those, um, the, you know, the arts and economic prosperity, 35,914 jobs. Those are jobs, a whole range, our economic models actually look at 533 separate industries uh, within a community. So there's the, all the jobs at our arts organizations, of which there's myriad, right? You know, it's, you know, arts jobs, there's non-arts jobs as well. Remember that also includes the hospitality aspect, uh, when we go out and we have dinner or we pay for parking. Um, all those, uh, all that event-related spending that's leveraged because of that arts experience. So it's really jobs uh, throughout uh, throughout the entire community. Arts jobs, non-arts jobs. Uh, it's a whole spectrum. And if you actually go to the uh, the economic website, part of our website, Arts and Economic Prosperity site, uh, you know you can see a lot more about the economic methodology. But the bottom line, these are jobs community-wide, not just in arts organizations. Good morning, my name is James Stone. I'm a local, San, a local Escondido working artist. Uh, my wife and I make our living from creating art and selling it. Right down the street, about two blocks from here. Um, this is a wonderful event. This is my third time coming to this event. I ask the same question every time. Uh, nobody seems to pick up on it. Um, the, the seed of what you're talking about, the beginning of what you're talking about, are the artists. The artists. Uh, I'd like to help everyone who's still here, uh, I'd like to help you understand this uh, with this, contract, uh, this question to contrast all of the numbers, which are wonderful, and I will use them in my own presentations. There's a really great thing you've done today to bring all this to our attention. But I'd like to contrast that with a reality question. You, any one of you can address it, but my question is really for the audience. Um, of the audience that's still remaining here, can I have a show of hands uh, of those of us who are working artists, making our living? Wow! That is fabulous. That is the best showing yet at any one of these meetings. Uh, so the artist, what you're doing, what you're assembling, how do we trickle that down, thank you Ronald Reagan, trickle that down to the artists? That's my question. All the way to the people who need the money. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it's absolutely, it doesn't happen without the artist. So what we're creating here, you know, we talked about our different studies, strategies, opportunities that uh, basically create more cultural opportunities, more arts opportunities, more funding for the arts. And I mean, who does that? Who, you know, I mean, we talked about a symphony. Well, who plays the symphony? It's musicians or, you know, our visual arts organizations. You know, so our organizations do, and I know our study, you know, the, the nonprofit one kind of had a nonprofit focus. Um, but the idea is if we can uh, get more people to buy art, like David said, appreciate the arts, value the arts, insist that when I go to the hospital, the arts are part of my healing. Um, I'm going to give you great stories uh, about that. So more opportunities for artists, you know, visual artists and performing artists. we got to make sure every child in this country, in this county, in this city, in this neighborhood, receives a quality arts education. Who's being involved there? It's the artists, it's the teaching artists, you know, who's doing it differently. So by advocating and making the case for funding for the arts, for a creative, culturally vibrant community, we're creating opportunities for artists. Uh, and so that's why, I mean, yeah, we, we, we all have to be champions for each other. Um, you got to invest in it, you got to nurture it, you got to grow it. And that's what we're here to do today. Can I, can I just um, throw in an, another, I, I might be off base here because again I come from the commercial world of for-profit business, um, but I have to say listening to the whole conversation, the reason Legoland California has grown over 19 years, it's two things, product development that my colleagues uh, are so good at, but also marketing, really strong, powerful, aligned marketing efforts, and I think that whole world of marketing Sits, it sounds like it sits somewhat separately from the creative arts and the non-profit world. And it might be kind of rather uh, diffused. It's, it's not aligned necessarily strongly enough. And if, I think if I, was, if I was, became president of this organization, if we decided to form an organization, I'd be asking my colleagues, how are we going to market the heck out of this and bring the world to our 
to our place, you know, and I, I think this is this. The marketing of Legoland California has been extremely strong and consistent, and it's it's kind of why we've grown. I think there's something in that. I'm not sure what it is, but I think there's something in that. Uh, real quick. Um, My last question. Okay. Do you want? I'll just, just real quick. We have a series called Guides to the Good Stuff. Oh. Do you want me? Just real quick, um, we have a series of guides to the good stuff as well that we send out in our digital marketing and it's on our website, you can see all the guides, but the guides, there are always artists as part of the guides, we've had, you know, our restaurant tours, but also our Zha Zha Ling, the, um, uh, the past uh, symphony um, director, and then Aaron Chang, photographer, so different artists are always featured in, in what we're doing. So it's not just about showing the art, but it's how does the art, artist see the world in San Diego? Where are the favorite places they like to go? And I think highlighting the, the people behind that art is important, and we try to do that in our programs. One more question here. Um, so I'll just speak loud. Um, I'm an arts administrator for the city of Chula Vista, and I just wanted to, it's not a question of comment, but who is an artist um, need Don't to get involved? Don't sit stop right there. <laughs> I encourage artists in the South Bay, and I'm a big proponent. I'm from Chula Vista, but I um, am active in the North County because I feel that the arts and the arts economy transcends jurisdictional boundaries. And my artists in the South Bay are not just going to make money in the South Bay, so they need opportunities across the board. But you as an artist, as Randy had mentioned, on commissions and committees and being a decision maker, you not only have to make sure that the decision makers are doing what they need to do, but you need to be on those committees that aren't arts committees. So I'm the mother of a teenager, and I always say become friends, not with their friends' parents, but with those children who aren't their friends' parents, because that's how you find out the information. So same thing. We are preaching to ourselves if we sit in a room full of artists, but if you're in a room on a planning commission or on a uh, funding committee or something like that in your community and you are bringing that perspective of an artist, that's what you need to do. So there has to be some sweat equity on the part of the artist to get involved in the bureaucracy of the cities. So I'm speaking firsthand. I know that we have a Measure P, a tax in incentive. There's not one artist represented on that, that committee, and it's a committee of 18 people that make the decision of where that money will be spent. So. It's kind of backwards, but that's what happens. So you have to be forward, and you have to think of yourself more of it than an artist. You're an entrepreneur, and you have to treat yourself like a business. And so when you're speaking, you have to speak with your value, what your value is, and sell yourself and brand yourself. So just some information. Are there any other really pressing questions for this wonderful panel to answer? Since you let us go. One more. Last one. Hi, good morning. I'm John Gabriel, Director of Education for San Diego Opera. Uh, I'm interested in, thank you for all the wonderful work and this great event. I'm interested in how the, the economic report and the benefits uh, reconciles or intersects with the extremely important uh, an artistic value of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So as that report uh, expounds on the economic benefits and the money and all of that, how does that, where does that intersect with accessibility? Thank you. Diversity, oh, diversity equity, and inclusion, huge issue obviously in our communities. Um, that's not really part of these studies, but I'll say this, if you look uh, at the uh, tourism research, domestic, international, visitor research, the travel these days, you know, we talked about looking for that authentic cultural experience. That means the 
diversity, the equity in a community. They want their big institutions. Yeah, the opera, fabulous. But you know what, uh, where we actually see the most growth now in the arts? Neighborhood arts and cultural organizations, culturally and ethnically specific arts organizations. You know, that's, that's that real local experience. Uh, so we need the whole spectrum. Uh, and so all of those uh, arts organizations are important. We didn't break it out uh, for this study, but let me just say, you want to drive tourism and visitorship, needs to be in your marketing, needs to be in your product, um, and you've got to make sure all those organizations in your community uh, are part of the process, are healthy. Remember that public opinion survey I talked about last year? I did. 67% um, of the American population says the arts unify our communities, regardless of age, race, or ethnicity. Two-thirds say the arts help me understand other cultures in my community. These are challenging times. These are fractious times we live in. It doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum. The public is giving us a solution. They're telling us, look, the arts. The arts are the glue that connect us together, that make us want to work together, live together, uh, be in a community together. We're on the right side of what needs to be done in this country. Thank you. If people are willing to stay, we will continue the questions and answers. So I know there are a few people at the back here that never had an opportunity. Hi, thank you. My name is Annie McPherson. I am a teaching artist, storyteller, and lover of all arts. Um, my question actually is, how do we share our resources? A lot of us have surplus, and then we have, in a way, a deficiency. So how do we network and share our resources um, my resource is the teaching artistry. Um, I'd love to network with a lot of you and um, partner and collaborate, but how do we create a platform or a way to communicate that we have needs and we have surplus? Thank you. Instagram. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I've met anybody that said I've got surplus. Um, I don't know if they ask for a show of hands. But you know what, NCAMP is a great local you know, networking opportunity because to me, every success is a collaboration. We're stronger together uh, than we are apart, and um, we really do uh, make each other better in that way. So, uh, I'm about to start about the surplus deficit piece, but um, you're absolutely, I think, on track that, you know, we got to do this together. Would you like me to give a, a, an example? I just meant, like, for example, this is a a place, so they have lots of rooms, for example, so they need people to fill it, and then, for example, the deficiency is you, you guys need the people to fill it, for example. An answer? Oh, yeah. So I have an answer. Um, at NCAN, we have talked about having on our website an area where we can, people can list what they're looking for, and people can list what they have. So that's going to be that connector. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Ed Kuntz. I'm the creative director for Theater Arts West. And following along this same line of questions here, uh, we're a 501c3 organization, and like, and like, and you know, always uh, trying to uh, our best to get as much money in as we can through ticket sales and donors. And uh, being an equity uh, theater company, we do. Every bit of that money that we get in from ticket sales uh, is divided up among the actors and the rest of us work uh, as we can. Now, uh, we, uh, uh, and what I was wondering, is there any sort of umbrella organization? Uh, and, and of course the NCAN, I understand that that can be as well, but uh, that would be, uh, whose primary uh, purpose would be to uh, coordinate resources and spaces in order to perform. As uh, like most companies, we don't really have a. We're floating. We don't really have a uh, a permanent location. So we, you know, we move from venue to venue. Whoever's got the space that we can book at the time. Sometimes we have to pay for it. Sometimes we don't. But uh, it, I, I would love to see uh, some sort of an organized uh, entity that 
did that for all the uh, various groups out there. And I, I wondered if such a thing already existed or uh, is that a job that I just talked myself into? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the letter. <laughs> it could be. There is Sammy who we call our culture coalition that is starting to branch out and talk about those ideas with partnership with INCAN and the South Bay. It's starting to happen. Right. Oh yeah, the tour of the museum. The museum's open. Thank you, our esteemed panelists, Randy. Thank you so much for participating, coming all the way out. You guys are awesome. I want to also just mention Leah Goodwin, who works here, is opening the local museum on campus for you guys. If you'd like to take a tour, please meet Leah in the lobby. It's She's right there. Uh, so go ahead and if you want to do that, it'll be complimentary thanks to the museum. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Please support us and can. We want to grow. We want to mobilize North County arts organizations and artists and provide services that many of you have, have asked for here today. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.